I think for them, it would be um, understanding, first of all, that you do need to remove yourself from being the project architect and start looking at it as a different job role. Business of Architecture, episode 275 of Architect Nation. I'm your host, Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for growing an impactful and profitable architecture practice. Today's an interview with Michelle Fenton, founder of Cora Architecture based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Michelle is a graduate of the architecture firm Freedom Formula program that I run with Scott Beebe. This is a program that helps firm owners go from overwhelmed operator to empowered owner. In today's episode, you'll discover the steps Michelle has taken to get a head start in starting her new architecture firm. How Michelle went from working 18-hour days and working weekends to having her weekends free. How to build a firm that can live without you and even better can actually survive and thrive without you there. So your employees, your staff, they aren't always depending on you to answer all of their questions, which we know can lead to that overwhelm. And the exercise that Michelle went through that absolutely revolutionized her concept of what it means to be a firm owner. If you haven't already, as a podcast listener, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared for you by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you will get instant access. And now with that, let's get on with today's show. And so then what I'd like to do, Michelle, is just kind of start out with the background of, 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 of your career, kind of why you started your firm. Then we'll get into why you decided to join the AFF program, uh, your biggest takeaways from going through that process, and then talk a bit about where you see yourself going in the future with all this new foundation that you've built up. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I, I, I think I always wanted to have my own architectural practice, but that was, of course, before I knew what that meant. Um, and I uh, worked for quite a bit uh, with a couple of really great architects, got great experience. And then in 2008, when the crash happened, um, I, I don't know, I guess it was quite, uh, it was affected in the U.S. as much as here, but lots of architects got laid off including myself. And so I thought that was a great opportunity to sort of revisit my career as an architect. And so I used that as a launching pad to start my business. So I started in 2000, I think officially spring of 2009, uh, maybe summer of 2009. And it's gone through a few iterations, the last one being a partnership with two other architects. One happened to be my husband and the other happened to be his old uh, boss. And so the three of us launched a firm um, and ran that for eight years doing like we did quite a bit of work. And then um, my husband decided that he wanted to pursue something different, um, which caused us to then get into this exploration phase of revisiting what we wanted to do. And so I, I decided to peel off and start my own business uh, again and mainly I was re- I really had the desire to focus on the types of clients that I really enjoyed working with so the, those were institutional clients clients who really needed um, to revisit their own process and so I started developing techniques for helping clients particularly institutional clients who are bringing various departments together as well as commercial clients who for example were um, expanding, they bought other companies, they needed to consolidate uh, what I, I I tend to call a, a cohesive culture and put that as part of the practice, as part of, part of the service that we provided in, in addition to architectural services. So Tom, what exactly does that mean? Uh, you, you talk about having the culture included in, t- in terms of the, as yeah. well as the architecture. Tell yeah. me more about that. So it's interesting because I, I kind of developed this system of going through their vision value missions in a very ad hoc, but um, uh, sort of a storytelling way. So I, I would interview CEOs, I would interview future partners, um, I would try to find who their competitors were, what they were doing, and try to position my clients um, in terms of um, how can they compete in the market? Um, how can they attract the people that they want to bring on board who they had an affiliation for in terms of um, personality, core values, that sort of thing. And so the design really came out of developing a system, a workplace strategy for them 
that fit their core values. And then the premise of that was if, if we set it up that way, then they begin to attract people who are naturally drawn to that type of culture. And so a lot of times what I found is that um, my clients didn't even understand what that meant until we started to dive into it. And they said, oh, yeah, well, you know, and then you get anecdotes that, oh, yeah, such and such didn't fit in because they, you know, didn't fit into this value or we, we had problems, they had great skills, but they, so th those kinds of stories became very common. And so I started, I decided that before we even started to do design work that we would do this analysis for our companies. Um, institutions were easier because they already had that um, attitude of exploring and collaborating with other departments. Um, and sitting down at the table with people who had different points of views and trying to work through that. And that was a very different process. So going into a meeting with institutional clients, um, the, the system was set up in terms of teasing out what they wanted to do, but the, the um, facilitation of um, varying departments with differing um, ideas and sometimes competing, um, wanting competing results it was really what that scope was about to try to bring people together and help them to understand that it's not a zero sum game. It's, you know, if, if one person wants a, and the other person wants B, it doesn't mean you can't have that. There's C and D can develop in between those gaps, which can be beneficial to both sides. So we started to, to um, a harness of practice based on that and it just seemed it just seemed like a good time to really push that agenda and being that i was the sole practitioner now um i i decided to try and learn a little bit more about my vision value statements <laughs> as opposed to just like pursuing my clients and i came upon the aff course um the AFS F course was also really timely because i was working 18 hour days i was not taking weekends off, I was not taking holidays. And so that attracted, that aspect of it attracted me to build some systems that can start to free me up. And I, I also thought it was because it would be easier to do it because it was just myself at the helm, as opposed to trying to negotiate that with two other partners. So that's where we were at. And then uh, the other part of it is just having the, the support of the group on the Thursday calls was very instrumental in helping me through that transition process because I'm not sure if you can imagine but going from a three-person practice a three-partner decision making to the buck stops with me um, was a little bit lonely <laughs> and a little bit um, uh, daunting and so the Thursday calls really helped me to to approach things in a calmer way and not be necessarily intimidated by making decisions on my own. Um, that support was actually pretty instrumental. I, I couldn't, the, the course was great, <laughs> but the Thursday calls were, were really in, incredibly helpful at that time. That's awesome. And why did you originally decide that you needed to go down this road uh, Michelle, what was happening in your business before in terms of, tell me about that need that you saw that you said, hey, I need to actually need to do this. Um, we didn't have a lot of systems. I We try to implement systems or I try to implement systems, but they never, well, I tried to develop systems that never got implemented. Um, and I was doing what everyone does is you work in a firm as a project architect uh, you come, you start your own practice and you're still a project ar architect. You're not a business owner. And I actually read E-Myth before I came upon your course. Um, and that totally shifted my mindset as to I was doing my job the wrong way. I was doing a different job. I was doing, I was still being a project manager, a project architect. And it's not being a for, for people that haven't read the e myth, give uh, summarize your key takeaways from that. What that meant for you in terms of a mindset shift, Michelle? Um, it just meant that I had to I, I had to give up the idea of I had to re how can I put this in succinctly? <laughs> um, I had to redefine my job, 
And first of all, I had to understand what that job was and then and then redefine it and pull away from the comfort zone of something I'd done for 20 plus years. Um, that and, and realizing that uh, if I didn't do that, the firm will always rely on me to be there, which meant I'll always need to work on weekends. I'll always need to work on vacations. I'll always need to work after dinner, you know. So I, I thought, well, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, and Emit showed me that, well, Emit explained that it was possible to do that. Um, but at the same time, I didn't think that Emit was sufficiently tailored to our type of business. And that's when I started to seek out um, opportunities that were more tailored. And then I came upon AFF. Awesome. You talk about having to redefine your job role. Michelle, what was your perspective on your job um, when we talk about the before state when you were uh, considering doing this? And you said when you realized you needed to redefine your job role or your position, what was it before? I was I was a project architect. I was jumping. It didn't matter what I did. I would go out and get a job. I would come back to the office and I would slip back into being a project architect and not continue to develop as a business owner because it was easy. I did it. I know how I knew how to do it. It was comfortable and 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 doing and. Well, I mean, first of all, I wasn't really necessarily aware of the differences between being a business owner and being a project architect. I thought if I was a project architect slash business owner, all I did was project architect more all the projects as opposed to three projects um, and then have people to help me with it as opposed to understanding that my role as a business owner was completely different than that of a glorified project architect. How is it completely different? Uh, well, the job I do is different. I don't sit around and do sketches and door schedules and even um, it, uh, detailed review of drawings. I actually implement processes that help other people do that with ease and with efficiency. So for example, a good one is reviewing drawings. So I would go and review drawings before I issue them. Mind staking, I would, bring them home at night, go through them bit by bit, find all the errors. The errors seem to be the same ones that were being made. And I thought, you know what, this, is, <laughs> this has got to change because I can't continue to review everyone's drawings all the time. And so I started to develop checklists, um, which allowed people, empowered the staff to actually review their own drawings based on a series of things that had to be in there before it even got to my desk. And so just being able to put systems in place really helped me remove from the day-to-day -day grind of the business and empower people to, to take that role on for themselves without being terrified. Because I think part of it too is we're a young team and um, I think they were scared to make mistakes. And so putting in, implementing, um, processes allowed them a little bit of breathing room so that they could check themselves before it even got to the point of me checking them. And so it gave them confidence as well. And, and it, I think it empowered them to take on more of a, of a leadership role in the firm as well. And they at the, the beginning of our conversation, they, they're, they're so incredibly amazed and thrilled to have processes. I never thought, I didn't think that it would be as important. I thought maybe it was more important for me <laughs> than them, but it's incredible. They've really embraced it. They love it. They want to keep writing processes. When did you bring employees on or staff? Well, we had employees um, probably um, about five years into the practice. So we've had, we've had some of the people that I've had now for about three to five years, uh, various stages. Um, and when we split off the firm officially in September, I brought over three, three and a half staff with me. So we're sharing one staff with the other partner. And so I inherited um, a number of people when the firm split out. 
So I've had awesome. people for five years, but again, very ad hoc, just did it the way I thought I saw other, other bosses do it, not understanding from the in. So I was, I was implementing, um, I was running a business based on my impression of what my previous bosses did or didn't do uh, from the outside, as opposed to really honing in on the job of the business owner. Hey, Architect Nation, real fast, I want to draw your attention to May 1st through the 3rd, 2019. I'm hosting the Architect Business Summit in Chicago, Illinois, and I would love to meet you there in person. During these three days, some of the most successful architects I've had the pleasure of working with will pull back the curtain to reveal what they're doing to grow their income, freedom, and impact as firm owners. This will be the must-attend event for architecture firm owners in 2019. You won't want to miss this. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash live to get information on who will be speaking and find out how to grab your ticket. Mm. What... uh, what do you think the program helped you with the most, Michelle? Um, focus, I think. Focused uh, process building and implementation. Um, I would say that that was key. Just having a very methodical way to, to develop and in, implement processes and also not being too concerned that they, are, they should be perfect. Just Just pushing ahead and getting them in place and then giving myself the opportunity to go back on a, on, in a rigorous way to tweak as opposed to waiting and waiting and waiting until it's perfect. And it never is. And it never gets implemented as a result. So I think the processes were a key, key part of it. And just seeing that build out was really encouraging. And what do you think has been the, the biggest impact that has had on your business? Um, well, immediately I don't work weekends, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is which sounds trivial, but it's important. It was important to me. It is important to me, and I, I think the team has a lot more confidence, including myself, and we are able to consider um, more innovative ways of doing our doing work because all of the um, mundane processes ha- are, are captured. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. It's written down, it's codified in our office manual. And so it's given us an opportunity to actually sit back and really think in a more innovative way about how we want to approach projects as opposed to how are we going to do the project. Um, we're now talking about how we approach the project which has been a shift in the firm, I'm finding. People are looking for more innovative ways to not just be more efficient, but to bring innovative ideas into the client's um, jobs. And I think it's just relieving us from the, from the burden of the mundane task day in, day out, because we don't worry about it anymore. It's just systems are in place. So we, we're, we're left free to roam. <laughs> in the creative realm a little bit more. Awesome. So that's very interesting that it's freed you up to be more innovative, more creative. Mm-hmm. Are there any other any other benefits that you've seen, Michelle, either in the business or in your personal life? Um, I am I'm more excited about the firm than I used to be. I'm definitely more jazzed about it. Um, I'm also looking at, uh, from a business perspective, um, looking for more innovative ways to think about how I can work as an architect, how we can work as architects to shape the city, to shape our projects, to not just in a physical way, but how can we start to impact clients and people who use those spaces in a way that is a little bit um, more, well, it's, it, we can, we can bring a lot more to the physical space than just nice materials. So we're starting to look at how we can have that sort of dialogue with our clients and ourselves. It's like what, what is the beauty? What is the value? What is the harmony in this space? Not what material are we going to use? What color is this wall? It's the, the level of discourse is um, 
it it's going, in my opinion, it's going in the right direction because at the end of the day, architecture is supposed to inspire and it's supposed to comfort. And so I think we're getting there, which is, which is beautiful. Awesome. Uh, concerning the, the deeper discourse that you guys are able to be involved in now, what, what are clients, as you approach them with this, your analysis that you're now offering them, uh, this, this deeper discourse that goes beyond the materiality of spaces that actually goes on with how people interact and a higher level of, of, um, of innovation around that, how are your clients responding to this new approach that you're developing in your firm? Well, some clients we don't let on at all <laughs> because some of them don't care. And so we just implement it anyways, as long as it's cost neutral. Um, some clients really want to engage in the dialogue. They want to understand what we mean by it. Um, and for every client, the meaning is different. It, it, it is tailored to who they are, what are their values, who do they want to bring in in the future? How do they want to shift their thinking? Um, and it's the, 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 that conversation is not, um, I find it's not necessarily an intellectual conversation when we get to clients. It's more um, an open conversation. So they're much more open. Uh, they they want to go down this road with us more. They, they're excited about, um, they're not as trepidatious about whether or not it'll work they're beginning to get excited about the idea, which makes our job really fun. So like I said, some clients are not gonna care and that's okay. Um, the ones that do are really, it, it's, it sounds intellectual, but it's, it doesn't become intellectual when we talk to them. It's, it's, there's a, <laughs> there's a, a, an opening that happens with them that I never used to experience before. Before conversations with clients were, well, how are we going to deliver this? What's it going to cost? Um, when when do we need to bring contractors on board? It's about the process. Whereas now it's about, well, what are your values? What are you hoping to do in your job role as the project manager for this university? What do you hope to bring to your position? So it's it's a different type of conversation. Mm, that's awesome, Michelle. You, you also mentioned that you're, you're feeling more confident, you're feeling better about the firm. Tell me exactly what you mean by that. How are you feeling better about it? What's feeling better? Um, the flow has been great. Um, again, because we have processes in place, I don't need to check in in every single detail. Um, uh, the group is really inspired and engaged. They're really feeling empowered to do, um, to do their job and to and to go color beyond the lines a little bit too, because there's room for that. Um, we are talking about implementing um, new systems in, uh, in terms of the workflow design flow process. So we're looking at, at tackling Revit as part of our design process. How do we, not just the day-to-day the -day delivery processes, but in terms of design flow, uh, technology, how do we start to push the boundaries on that and our capabilities for that? It's It's been, it feels like we're in it together as opposed to me driving it because at the beginning it was me driving it. Um, but again, what the AFF program allowed for is for, for me to start engaging the employees as part of that, of building the process out with me. And so they, they've become more engaged the the studio environment is 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 even more collaborative um in a meaningful way than it used to be i think we kind of paid we tried i think we used to pay a bit of lip service to collaboration now it's truly i see it happening whereas someone would just jump in and help out and, or say you know what i was just writing i actually heard this the other day Someone was like, well, I'm not sure how to do this. And we've done it a few different ways. And someone said, turned around from their desk and said, oh, don't worry about it. I'm just finishing up writing a process for that because I was, I was just finishing that same thing. And as soon as I'm done, we'll, I'll, I'll link you to it and we can look at it. Like, I literally heard that two weeks ago. I thought, wow, that was, that's amazing. So that's happening. 
Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, it's 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 pretty awesome to see the foundation from my perspective. You, you've, you're building a really strong foundation here for something in the future. What is your five year plan? Your ten year plan for the for the firm? <clears throat> um, my five. Well, it's it used to be five years. Now it's about three. The three year plan for the firm is I'd like to really codify our position in the market for um, institutional work and more institutional work, commercial interiors. Yes but the institutional work is very inspiring. So we'd like to do more of that. And um, I really want to be able to shore up ourselves in the marketplace as sort of the top five in the market. Um, go to people that, that provide a, a, a holistic approach to, to the work. Um, in 10 years, um, I would like to shift my role as partner in this firm and uh, look at doing more R&D work, which could feed into the firm, but I'm looking at doing more R&D work in terms of um, the psychology of architecture and space. So I'm, I'm hoping that the business can, in, in, the, in the values and mission that we have, it's leading towards that direction, but I, I, I would like in 10 years to re remove myself from the actual running of the practice and start a new branch um, of R&D work. Awesome. I, that was not my vision before this program. Before this program, I was gonna die at my desk and that was, and the doors will close when I leave. <laughs> and that was it. And they would write on your tombstone, she lived a great life as a hardworking architect. Yeah, yeah, and that's, what it would have amounted to which is okay but not enough not what you aspire to yeah. michelle uh who would you recommend this program for um well i've been recommending it for uh quite a few of my friends who are in their own businesses sole proprietors um i think it would be difficult to implement this well actually maybe not it may not be difficult to implement this for people who are in partnerships because i think that was one of the struggles i had is that i didn't have a structure to actually go present to my other two partners and say let's follow this it was my idea or their idea as opposed to structure but in terms of my friends who are sole proprietors um i i get that it's lonely out there with with, with doing that and it's you're the one that is responsible for people's lives. So I think I would recommend this to them first and foremost. Uh, but you know, now that I mention it, I do see how I could help people who are in partnerships. I never thought about that until just now. And these people that you would recommend it to, I mean, what are they probably struggling with right now that you would think that this would be a good recommendation for them? They're struggling with process. There's, again, they're coming from the similar, you know, great project architects, very successful in, in businesses that they were um, associates at, went out on their own. And they're, as Michael Gerber says, they're still glorified technicians. Um, and I bought e -Myth for everyone in my friend group who has a business for Christmas. <laughs> wow. Um, but I think the mind shift is something that was key. And uh, without that understanding that, hang on a second, I'm not actually doing my job. Um, I am just a glorified project architect. Uh, there, there are a number of people who could use that mind shift that I know of. Um, so yeah, I think, I think for them, it would be um, understanding, first of all, that you do need to remove yourself from being the project architect and start looking at it as a different job role. Um, actually writing a job role for myself in that, uh, in the job roles that we had to write, I think was module one was, was interesting <laughs> because I actually sat down and wrote a job role for myself, which, which was, um, it codified everything that was swirling around in my head with all the books and information and all that. And just to have to sit and write it down and say, well, this is what I should be doing was really interesting. That's when I think the light bulb, it was flickering, but that it, it went on that day. It went on, it's been burning bright ever since. It seems to be, we'll see. <laughs>
We'll, see. well M- Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story with us. Congratulations on officially graduating from the program. Uh, you've, you've implemented a lot. It's been fun to see you as you've implemented and inspired the other members of the program as well. Thank you, Enoch. It was really, I'm very grateful. Thank you. And that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michelle Fenton talking about how she has laid a foundation for the future success of her firm, how she's been able to go from feeling very overwhelmed as a new firm owner to feeling empowered as someone that has an organization and a team that she can leverage to get results far beyond what she could do on her own. If you'd like to discover the specific steps and path that Michelle went through to be able to achieve this inner firm. I've prepared a one hour free presentation for firm owners just like yourself. You can access this online by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. So go ahead, check that out. There are multiple times that are offered. You can watch that from the comfort of your office or your home. I hope you enjoy it. As always, the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.